Welcome to Professor Teaches Netscape Communicator. To take a lesson, just click on the lesson number or title. We recommend that you begin by taking the lesson called How to Use This Course. Have fun! Welcome to Professor Teaches Netscape Communicator. To take a lesson, just click on the lesson number or title. We recommend that you begin by taking the lesson called How to Use This Course. Have fun! Welcome to Lesson 1 in the fascinating world of the Internet. In this lesson, you're going to learn just what the Internet is. Specifically, I'll give you a quick description of the Internet. And you'll learn some buzzwords, such as client and server, We'll also go over the many things you can actually do on the Internet. I'll tell you what you need to access the Internet and how a Netscape communicator fits into the picture. Finally, you'll learn about Internet addresses, such as URLs and email addresses, which are used to locate information. Look over the lesson topics for a moment, then click the mouse anywhere on the screen when you're ready to continue. So, what exactly is the Internet? Well, if you ask 10 different people that question, you'll probably get 10 different answers. But quite simply, the Internet is just a bunch of computers that are connected to one another through telephone lines or other types of communication lines. Right now, there are literally millions of computers around the world that make up the Internet. Each of these computers contains various information that can be accessed by anybody with a computer, a modem, a telephone line, and the right kind of software. Once you're connected to the Net, you can jump around to different computers and look at the information stored there. You can even permanently transfer some of this information to your own computer if you want. Look over the screen for a moment, then click the mouse when you're ready to continue. So when you access the Internet, does your computer become part of the Internet? Well, not necessarily, and that's where this whole notion of the Internet can get a little confusing. There are basically two types of computers involved in the Internet. First. They're the computers that actually store information and make themselves accessible to anyone with the right equipment. These computers are called hosts, or servers. They have special software installed on them to make them accessible to other computers. The second type of computer involved in the net is the typical John Doe computer, like yours and mine. These are computers that can access the information on the Internet, but cannot be accessed themselves by other computers. In other words, when I connect to the Internet, I can wander around and visit other computers, but no other computers can actually visit my computer. Computers that access the Internet are called clients. So, although a client can access the Internet, it's not considered a part of the Net unless it has that special software to make itself a server as well. Look over the screen, then continue. Another area that can be confusing is the difference between a commercial online service, such as America Online or CompuServe, and the Internet. They aren't the same thing. An online service consists of its own computers storing specific information that can be accessed only by members of that service, kind of like a club. When you join an online service, you access the information provided by that service, such as their news updates and their discussion groups. However, most services now provide the means for you to go outside the online service and access the Internet. But the operative word here is outside. Even though you can use an online service to get to the Internet, there are still two different animals. We'll look at the different ways you can access the Internet later in this lesson. Click the mouse when you're ready to move on. Perhaps the best way to describe the Internet is to describe all the things you can do on it. As I mentioned before, there's a ton of information stored in computers on the Net, and most people use the Internet to look at this information. Information is stored in different ways the most popular way being the World Wide Web. The Web has become almost synonymous with the Internet, but it's just a part of the Net. In other words, the Web is only one way a computer on the Internet can store information. The Web stores information in what we call Web Pages. 
Web pages can contain text, pictures, photographs, sounds, even animation. The thing that makes the web neat is that once you access a web page, you can jump directly to other pages by clicking on a special area of the page. You'll learn all about the World Wide Web in Lesson 3. Another way you can use the Internet is to send electronic mail to other people set up with electronic mail. Also referred to as email, this great invention lets you communicate almost instantly with people all over the world. You'll learn about email in Lesson 4. The Internet also provides a way to send and receive information among groups of people with special interests. These groups are called news groups or discussion groups. The Usenet part of the Internet lets you join and interact with thousands of news groups. We'll cover news groups in Lesson 5. Look over the screen, then click when you're ready to continue. Another way to get information is to visit a Gopher site on the Internet. Gopher sites contain information that you access through a series of text menus. Although some Gopher sites display pictures, most Gopher sites offer information in just a simple text format. If you want to get a specific file from the Internet, such as a free game, you can visit an FTP site and send the file to your computer. FTP sites are kind of like storage containers for files. Generally, you can't view the contents of the file. You can just send it to your own computer. This is called downloading a file. I'll show you some FTP sites and Gopher sites in Lesson 6. Another cool thing you can do on the Internet is actually log into another computer and work directly with the programs on that computer. Not all computers on the Internet offer this feature, but if they do, you log on to their computer using a feature called Telnet. A lot of university computers offer this feature, allowing people to work with the programs and data stored on those computers. Look over the screen, then click to continue. So far, I've covered the various things you can do on the Internet, such as sending email, visiting web pages, and downloading files from FTP sites. But how do you actually access the Internet so you can do all this great stuff? Assuming you already have a computer, a modem, and a telephone line, you basically need two more things to hook into the Internet. An account with a company that sells access time to the Internet, and some software that lets you view and work with the information on the net. Let's look at how you buy access time. If you subscribe to an online service, such as America Online, chances are that the service can act as your provider and give you access to the Internet. Or, you can buy access time directly from an Internet service provider, also known as an ISP. Or, if your company's network has access to the Internet, you don't need to buy anything. Most companies nowadays have a constant link to the Internet, which is accessible to employees. When you sign up with an Internet service provider, you pay a certain amount of money every month to access the Internet for a certain number of hours. All these certain amounts and certain numbers vary among service providers. Many providers nowadays offer a flat rate for unlimited monthly access. After you sign up, you access the provider's computer using the telephone number they give you. From there, the provider links you into the Internet and you're on your way. Well, I take that back. You're almost on your way. Your Internet service provider gets you the physical connection to the Internet. But you also need that software I was talking about. In order to view web pages, access FTP sites, and send email, you need special software designed to do that stuff. A software program that lets you view web pages is called a browser. A program that lets you send and receive email is called, well, <laughs> it's just called an email program. There's also special software for accessing FTP sites and for viewing Gopher sites. Look this over and then click to continue. Fortunately, Netscape Communicator comes with all the programs you need to surf the net. Netscape Navigator, the web browser, lets you visit the World Wide Web, FTP sites, and Gopher sites. Netscape Messenger is a sophisticated yet easy-to-use email program. And Netscape Calabra opens up the world of news groups to you. If you want to build your own web page, Netscape even provides you with a tool to do that, the Composer. Netscape Netcaster provides a handy way for worldwide web pages to be delivered and updated on your computer automatically through the use of channels. Finally, if you want to talk and work with other Netscape users, you can dial up using Netscape Conference. You might have heard of Netscape Navigator already. Before Netscape developed Communicator, the Navigator program was the only product people needed to explore the Internet. It included a web browser, a mail program, and a newsgroups program. Then Netscape decided to split up these three programs, add a few more, and bundle them all together. The result was Communicator, a complete set of Internet programs. We're going to spend the remaining lessons in this course using these programs to explore the Internet. Look this over and then click to continue. 
Before we wrap up this lesson, I need to explain one more important thing about the internet. I've been talking about using the internet to visit web pages and FTP sites, but how does the internet keep track of where all these pages and sites are? And more importantly, how do you know where they are? Well, every single page or site of information on the internet is considered a document. For example, a web page is a document, and the first set of menus at a Gopher site is also considered a document. Each document is assigned a unique address called a URL, or Uniform Resource Locator. A URL is the same concept as your own home address. Your home address consists of several parts, such as a general part, the state, and a specific part, your house or apartment number. Look this over and then click to continue. Let's look at some typical URLs. As I mentioned earlier, information can be stored in different ways on an Internet computer. Information in web pages is stored one way, files at an FTP site are stored another way, and documents at a Gopher site are stored yet another way. The boring technical details about how they're stored aren't as important as the fact that these areas of the Internet are a little different from each other. The way information is stored is called its protocol, another term to add to your list of Internet terminology. To get back to URLs, the first part of the address identifies its protocol, that is, what kind of information it is. For example, HTTP stands for Information Stored as a Web Page, and FTP stands for Information Stored as a File at an FTP site. Later in the course, I'll give you the full names for all of these cryptic acronyms. The protocol part of the address is generally separated from the rest of the address by a colon and two forward slashes. The next part of the address identifies the actual computer that's storing the information. If you recall, a computer on the Internet is called a server. So, this part is called the server address. It usually consists of three parts, separated by dots. The last part of the server address identifies the type of organization owning the computer. For example, COM stands for commercial, and EDU stands for educational, such as a university. The middle part stands for the computer itself, and the first part identifies a specific section within the computer. For World Wide Web pages, this part is often named www, but it doesn't have to be. The very last part of the URL identifies the specific document within the server. It may also include the folder or subfolders containing the document. For example, this series of subfolders and document contains the feedback page for Netscape's website. Not all URLs contain this part. Look over the screen for a moment, then we'll continue. You might have heard of email addresses before. These are slightly different from uniform resource locators because an email address is not really a document. It's just a storage area for email messages. This is my email address. The part to the right of the at sign represents the computer or server that stores all my email messages. That computer is usually the Internet Service Provider's computer. I use a provider so my email stuff is on their server. Notice that this server address is in the same format as the server address in a URL. The part before the at sign is generally your user ID that your provider gives you. We'll be working with URLs and email addresses a lot during the course, so if they're a little fuzzy right now, don't worry. Look over the screen one last time. Now it's time for a quick review of what you've learned in this lesson. I'm not going to talk to you during the review. Instead, just look over each screen that's displayed and simply click your mouse or press any key to move on to the next review screen. Click when you're ready to begin. This concludes Lesson 1. I hope you enjoyed your brief introduction to the Internet. If you're unsure about anything we covered in this lesson, you should take some or all of it again. In Lesson 2, we're going to take a first look at the Navigator web browser and explore some of its basic features. Until then, goodbye.
Welcome to Lesson 2. In this lesson, we're going to fire up Netscape Communicator and work with its web browser called Navigator. Specifically, you'll learn about the major programs contained in Communicator. Then we'll access the Internet using its most popular program, the Navigator web browser. We'll examine various features of the Navigator window, and you'll learn several ways to link to other web pages. We'll experiment with some of Navigator's navigation tools to go back and forth among documents. Finally, I'll show you where to download the latest version of Netscape Communicator. Look over the lesson topics for a moment, then click the mouse anywhere on the screen when you're ready to continue. Let's start from the Windows 95 desktop. Actually, this is just a simulation of Windows as it appears on my own computer. Your real Windows setup will probably look slightly different. If you recall from Lesson 1, many people access the Internet using an Internet service provider and Internet software, such as Communicator. Or if your computer is hooked into your company's network, you use your company's link to the Internet and possibly a network copy of Internet software. During this course, we're using my own personal computer and a commercial Internet provider. I purchased a copy of Communicator directly from Netscape, which we'll also be using. As you can see here on my desktop, I have shortcuts to both my Internet provider and Netscape Communicator. In a moment, we'll double-click the Communicator shortcut, but first I want to point out another way to access Communicator through the Programs menu. Click the Start button. Now, I'll highlight the Programs menu. Here is the Communicator menu. I'll highlight it now. These are the programs within Communicator that you'll work with the most. As I mentioned earlier, Netscape Navigator is the web browser that lets you surf the World Wide Web, as well as FTP and Gopher sites. The Netscape Messenger is the mail program. You use it to send and receive email messages. Netscape Calabra is the news program, which allows you to participate in newsgroup discussions. Netscape Composer is like a word processor that lets you create your own web pages. And Netscape Conference lets you talk to other Netscape users on the Internet. You can access any of these communicator programs by simply clicking the item. But we're going back to the desktop. Click the Start button to remove all the menus. Thanks. As you just saw, Communicator is made up of many different components. So, if you double-click this icon, which component will be opened? Well, you can specify which part of Communicator is open through this icon, but if you don't, Netscape Navigator is automatically launched. Later in the course, I'll show you where to specify this. When you double-click this icon in a moment, the Navigator browser will be launched and will be on our way to the World Wide Web. By the way, the first time you launch Communicator, you'll be asked for some information. I've already run the program, so we won't see those messages. Go ahead and double-click the Communicator shortcut. Since I wasn't connected to the Internet, Netscape automatically brought up the connection dialog box for my Internet provider. If I'd already been connected, we wouldn't see this. My username and password are automatically in the dialog box, so just click the Connect button. Now you can see the entire Netscape Navigator window. Navigator is in the process of connecting to Netscape's site on the World Wide Web, so it can display its web page. By default, that's the first thing that's displayed when you open up the program. Later on, I'll show you how you can change what's displayed when you first open Navigator. Here we go. This is Netscape's home page. A home page is the first page in a series of pages that are stored in a website. Netscape often updates its web pages, so when you access this page using a real system, the page will probably look different. Let me back up a little and briefly explain what happened between the time we launched Navigator and the time this page was displayed. After we made the connection to the Internet, Navigator used that connection to hook into the Netscape server. When it located the Netscape server, it transferred a copy of its home page to my computer, which is now displayed in the window. The URL of the home page is displayed up here in the location box. Look this over and then click to continue. Not all of the home page is displayed right now. Click inside the scroll bar here to see more of the page. Netscape's home page provides information about the latest Netscape products as well as ways to surf the net. 
For example, clicking on this underlined word brings up a web page of information about downloading Communicator. This underlined phrase is called a link because in effect it links you to another page of information. And that page could even be on another computer on the internet. Now scroll back up the page. Before we start bouncing around the internet, let's take a closer look at the Navigator window. Like all Windows programs, Navigator has a title bar. The company name, Netscape, appears here, as well as the name of the current document. In this case, the current document is the Welcome to Netscape web page. The menu bar contains menus of items used to work with the program. Notice there's a Communicator menu. This menu lets you access other components of Communicator directly from the Navigator window. The toolbar contains buttons that serve as shortcuts to the most common menu items. Although the toolbar buttons don't really look like buttons, they work the same way. These two sections are also considered toolbars, which have a special purpose in life. We'll be using quite a few menu items and toolbar buttons throughout the course, so I won't explain the use of each one right now. As I mentioned earlier, the location box displays the URL of the document currently displayed inside the window. Since we're looking at a World Wide Web page, the first part of the address is HTTP. The name of Netscape server is next. The location box is handy, not only because it tells you where you are, but because you can use it to actually go to another site. By just typing in a new URL and pressing Enter, you're on your way to another exciting part of the Internet. Look over the screen for a moment, and then click to continue. The picture of the N is called the status indicator. If you noticed before, it becomes animated while Navigator is locating or transferring a document. Now look at the bottom of the Navigator window. This is called the status bar, and although it looks pretty quiet right now, it can be quite the hub of activity while working with Navigator. The message, Document Done, tells us that Navigator has finished displaying the page and is ready to move on to something else if you want. Look this over, then click to continue. This floating box is called the Component Bar. You can use it to access other components of Communicator, such as the mail program. If you don't like it on top of the window, you can dock it onto the status bar. Go ahead and click its close button. A smaller version of the component bar now appears on the right side of the status bar. I like it better there, so let's just leave it. Now let's put Navigator to work so we can experiment with some of the features I just told you about. I want you to scroll down this web page, but instead of clicking inside the scroll bar, just press your page down key twice. Good. If you recall, an underlined word or phrase is called a link, and clicking on it displays a new document. I'm going to move the mouse pointer to the More News link. Notice that the mouse pointer changed to a hand. This happens whenever the mouse pointer is on a link. It's a handy feature, no pun intended, especially since not all links appear as underlined words. During our simulation, however, the mouse pointer will change to a hand only when we're directly working with a link. When you work with your real Navigator program, you'll see the mouse pointer change every time you move it to a link. Now, look down in the status bar. Navigator is telling us where the link will take us. It's displaying the URL of the document where this link leads. Look this over, then click the link. I'm going to take some liberties in the world of simulation now and slow down the process of linking to the new page. That way I can show you some things that generally happen when you link somewhere. First, notice that the status indicator in the top right corner has become animated. That tells us that Navigator is in the process of accessing the page we linked to. If we get tired of waiting for the new page, we can click the Stop button to cancel the transfer. The status bar has also sprung to life. It's telling us various things, such as that it's connecting to the page, reading a certain percentage of it, and transferring the data. Let's just watch until the page is completely loaded. There. Navigator has finished transferring the page as evidenced by the status bar message. Notice also that the end picture has settled down and the stop button is no longer active. Keep in mind, however, that sometimes the stop sign remains active even after a page is fully loaded. That's because the page might contain something like a running animation. The About Netscape page is now displayed, and the location box contains the URL of the new page. Actually, the label of the location box has changed to NetSite since we linked to a different Netscape web page. 
Look all this over, then click when you're ready to continue. One of the great things about surfing the internet is that Navigator keeps track of where you've been. That makes it easy to move around among pages you've just visited. For example, the back button in the toolbar returns you to the page you were looking at right before this one. First, I'll move the mouse pointer over the back button. Notice that the button now appears in a brighter color and looks three-dimensional. That happens whenever you move the mouse pointer over a toolbar button. Go ahead and click the back button now. See, we're now back at Netscape's homepage, at the exact place where we linked to another document. Notice here that the More News link now appears in red. Whenever you click a link, Navigator automatically changes its color so that you know which links you've already clicked. This keeps you from repeating yourself over and over and over again. Now click the Forward button to go to the page we accessed right after the home page. The Home button is cool because it always brings up a new copy of the first page Navigator brings up when you connect. In our case, that's the Netscape home page, but it could be something else if you specify it. We'll get to that later in the course. Go ahead and click the Home button. And here's the home page. Another way to navigate among pages is to use the Go menu. Please click it. The lower section of this menu is called the History List, and it displays the documents you've visited, starting with the most recent one. To bring up a document, you just click its name in the list or type the number appearing next to it. We'll work with the History List later in the course. Look it over, then click the Go menu again to remove it. Next, I'm going to show you how to be the master of the digital forces of the Internet. <laughs> this time we're going to link to a new page, but I'm going to stop the transfer midstream. First, I'll move the mouse pointer to the words Netscape Store here. Notice that the mouse pointer changed to a hand, meaning these words are actually a link. Go ahead and click it. OK, Navigator is transferring the page. I'll click the Stop button now. There. Notice that just part of the document displayed. Usually, clicking the Stop button stops the transfer and just displays whatever part of the page has already been sent. In some cases, however, none of the document is displayed. In our case, we did get some of the document. These little creatures are placeholders for graphics or pictures that weren't transferred. Many documents transfer their text information first, then transfer the graphic parts. By the way, clicking the status indicator also stops the transfer, but then you're automatically returned home to the first page of your Internet session. As you venture further out into cyberspace, this feature can be quite handy. Look this over, and then click to continue. So what if we really do want to see this page? Well, you can click the Reload button here. That tells Navigator to transfer another copy of the page to your screen. Click the Reload button now. That's better. If you ever want to download a newer version of Communicator, this is the page to visit. There are several Netscape store links on Netscape's homepage, which you can visit using any web browser. We're finished working with Navigator for now. Close the Navigator window by clicking the Close button in its title bar. Thanks. I'll disconnect us from my Internet provider. Now, click the mouse anywhere on the screen when you're ready to move on to the lesson review. Let's review what you've learned. As in the previous lesson, I won't talk during the review. Just click the mouse or press any key to move on to each review screen. Click when you're ready to begin. This concludes Lesson 2. 
Now that you have a general idea of how the Navigator browser works, you're ready to dive into using its most popular features. In Lesson 3, we're going to have a lot of fun surfing the most popular area of the Internet, the World Wide Web. See you then! Welcome to Lesson 3. In this lesson, we're going to put on our surfer gear and dive into the World Wide Web. Specifically, you'll learn just what the web is, and you'll see what makes a web page different from your typical computer document. We'll use the Netscape Navigator to visit some cool websites, and you'll learn how to create bookmarks for your favorite places. You're going to permanently save the information from a web page on your computer, and we'll bravely look at some of the error messages you might get while surfing. You'll also see how to control the graphics that are displayed while you're looking at web pages. Finally, I'll show you where you can customize Navigator and Communicator to suit your own personal preference. Look over the topics for a moment, and then click anywhere to continue. You've no doubt heard about the World Wide Web, and to many people it's this big, mysterious entity hovering somewhere out there in cyberspace. Actually, the concept of the web is similar to the concept of the Internet. If you recall, the Internet is basically a bunch of computers connected to each other through communication lines. Each computer on the Internet stores information that can be accessed by other computers. This information can be stored in different ways. One way information is stored is on a web page. If an Internet computer has web pages on it, then it's considered part of the World Wide Web. So you can think of the web as being like a subset of all computers on the Internet. Look over the screen, then click to continue. Now let's get back to this idea of a web page. Web pages are different from other types of information on the Internet, because you can use a web document to link to other places on the Internet. That's what makes it a web, get it? As you'll learn later, that's not the case with other types of Internet information. Another unique thing about web pages is that they can display different types of stuff such as text, graphics, photographs, animation, sound, even videos. Most of the other information on the net can't do that. Web pages can do all of these neat things because they're written in a special programming language. This language is called HTML, short for Hypertext Markup Language. Even though it's considered a programming language, HTML is really like a glorified word processor. You write a document and format certain areas of it, such as linking areas and picture areas. Communicator offers a nice program to build HTML documents called Netscape Composer. Look this over, and then we'll get going. We're going to surf the web using Communicator's most popular component, Netscape Navigator. Since you learned how to open Navigator during the previous lesson, we'll begin from the Navigator window. As you can see, Navigator automatically accessed the Netscape website and transferred the home page to the window. As you can see in the location box, this document's URL begins with HTTP, meaning it's a World Wide Web page. I promised you in Lesson 1 that I'd tell you what HTTP stands for. Okay, here goes. It stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. That's the second time you've heard the word hypertext, so I guess I should explain it. Hypertext is any piece of information that can be used to jump to another set of information. The most common form of hypertext is the link, a word or phrase that's generally underlined. Click the mouse when you're ready to continue. There are many ways to link to different web pages. You can click on an underlined word, click on one of these links, enter a URL in the location box, or even use some of Navigator's toolbar buttons. You can also click one of the handy buttons on this toolbar, which is called the Personal Toolbar. Navigator has provided four links already, but you can also add your own button links here. One of my favorite ways to surf the web is by clicking the New and Cool button, which offers several links. Go ahead and click it now. The first item on the menu takes you to a web page offering links to new sites on the Internet. The second item offers a list of what's cool. Click the What's Cool item. This page looks a little different, doesn't it? It's divided into frames. Each of these frames contains a separate document. We'll work more with frames later in the course. The What's Cool page offers links to cool sites on the World Wide Web. Click inside the vertical scroll bar a couple of times to move down the page. Clicking on any of the underlined links takes you directly to that website. 
A friend of mine told me that there used to be a vegetarian website listed here. A quick way to search for something on a web page is by using the Find item. Click the Edit menu now. Now, click the Find in Frame item. We can search using just a few letters. Type VEGE. -E. Now, click the Find Next button. Sure enough, there it is. Click the Cancel button. Let's check out this web page. I'll move the mouse pointer over its link. Notice that the Navigator status bar displays the URL of the link. As you can see, the Veggies page lives on a different computer, meaning we'll go shooting out further into cyberspace if we visit it. Well, let's do that. Please click its link. Oops. Although this message may be a little disconcerting, it's actually not unusual. The Internet is such a busy and happening place that often a site can get overloaded with requests. That's probably what happened here, although there are other reasons for a site to be unavailable. Your best bet is to try again later. But I really want to visit this page, so let's try it again now. First, click the OK button to get rid of this message. Now click the Veggies Unite link again. Well, okay, we made it this time. Even though I'm not a vegetarian, this still looks like a neat page. In fact, I'd probably like to visit here again. But I really don't want to have to click my way through the What's Cool page to get here. Fortunately, Navigator provides an efficient way to go right to a specific web page. It's called a bookmark. I'll show you how it works. First, click the Bookmarks toolbar button. This menu consists of different folders of bookmarks that enable you to go right to a web page. For example, I'll highlight the Entertainment folder. Clicking any of these bookmarks takes you right to the page. Now I'll remove the submenu. We want to add a bookmark for the web page currently displayed on the screen. Click the Add Bookmark item. That's all there is to it. Navigator just created a bookmark for the Veggies Unite page. Click the Bookmarks button again, and I'll show you. The Veggies Unite bookmark appears at the very bottom of the menu. The next time we want to visit this page, we can just click the Veggies item. It doesn't matter where on the Internet we happen to be at the moment. Notice that there's a folder called My Stuff right above our new bookmark. That's a nice place to keep your own personal bookmarks, so I'll show you how. Instead of clicking the Add Bookmark item, I'll highlight the File Bookmark item now. Next, you just click on the folder that will contain the bookmark to the current page. Go ahead and click on the My Stuff folder. Good. Now click the Bookmarks button again. We now have two Veggies Unite bookmarks, one at the bottom of the menu and one within the My Stuff folder. Let me show you how you can work with your bookmarks. Click the Edit Bookmarks item. The Bookmarks window acts as a kind of file manager, like the Windows 3.1 File Manager or the Windows 95 Explorer. You can add, delete, and edit bookmarks from this window, and even set up different folders containing bookmarks. And bookmarks can take you to more than just web pages. If the place you want to go has a URL, such as an FTP site, then you can make a bookmark for it. Let's delete the duplicate Veggies Unite bookmark. Click inside the scroll bar to reach the bottom. Next, click on the last Veggies Unite bookmark. Finally, press the Delete key on your keyboard. There we go. We're all set. Look this over, then close the Bookmarks window by clicking the Close button. If you recall, the History list on the Go menu also lets you jump to another location on the net. Click the Go menu now. Here's the History list of sites you've visited since the time you opened Navigator. However, when you close Navigator, this list will disappear. Bookmarks, on the other hand, will always remain in the bookmark list until you take them off. Now click the Go menu again to remove it. Before we move on, let me mention another way to add a quick link to a favorite page. You can add a button link to the personal toolbar using either the bookmarks window or by using this little icon. Dragging this icon onto the personal toolbar creates a link to the URL that's currently displayed inside the NetSite box. Look over the screen, then click to continue. OK, I'm getting hungry. Click inside the scroll bar to move down the page.
Notice there are a lot of interesting links on this page. Look them over, then click the 2000 Vegan Recipes link. Notice there's a link called No Frames. Some websites let you view their pages without using frames. It can be easier to read the information that way. Since I'll be showing you frames later in the course, let's choose the No Frames option. Please click it now. Next, click the Quick and Easy Recipes link. Hmm, let's try the Barbecue Onion Sandwich link. Click it now. This looks tasty. By the way, to protect the innocent, we've changed the email address of the person submitting the recipe. Although I'd like to spend some time reading over the recipe, it would be more efficient to look it over later, when I'm not spending money connected to the Internet. And, of course, it would be handy to have a printed copy of this recipe to try it out. If you have a printer, you can print out the displayed document by clicking the Print button. You can also save a copy of the document permanently on your computer and print it out later. Although this document was transferred to my computer for display, it won't stay there unless we request it. Let's save it on my computer. First, click the File menu. The Save As item here lets you save the page on your computer. Please click it. Now we see the Save As dialog box. If you've saved files in other programs, this box might look familiar. Navigator automatically selected the Program folder as the folder that will contain the new file. We could change it if we wanted to using any of these buttons, but we'll just keep it. Now look at the file name and Save As Type boxes. If you recall, web pages are written using a special programming language called HTML, so their file extensions generally end in HTM or HTML. The actual file name of this web page is called 1510.html. Now, we could save the page as an HTML file, but suppose we want to send it to someone who doesn't have a web browser. Fortunately, Navigator lets you save most files in a more standard format. Click the drop-down button here. Almost any computer can read a plain text file. It won't look nearly as pretty as the HTML web page, but the information will be there. Click the plain text item. Next, we should change the file name to something more meaningful. Double-click the file name, and then type the letters BBQ. Look this over, then click the Save button. Good. Later on, you can access the barbecue file through the Notepad program or any other text editor. OK, let's continue our journey. I want to show you the website for the Library of Congress. This time, we're going to link to that page by just entering its URL. There are two ways to enter it. We can type it in the NetSite box here and press Enter, or we can bring up the Open Page dialog box and type it in there. Let's try the second way. Click the File menu. Now click the Open Page item. Now all you have to do is type in the URL of the site you want to visit. Since we're linking to a web page, please start by typing HTTP, a colon, and two forward slashes. Now type in the rest of the URL displayed in the lesson status bar. You know, I just remembered that if you're linking from a web page to another web page, you don't have to type in the HTTP part of the URL. Oh well, I'll remember that next time. Go ahead and click the Open button. And here we are at the Library of Congress. So far, you've been clicking the left mouse button on the link to go to that link's page. Well, you can manipulate a link in other ways by clicking the right mouse button on it. Go ahead and click the right mouse button on the American Memory link. Now you see a pop-up menu of options that are used to manipulate this link. For example, the Open in New Window item opens up the page pointed to by the link, but instead of opening it in the current Navigator window, it displays it in a separate browser window. You can also add a bookmark for the page pointed to by the link. This menu provides a handy way to perform some common Internet activities. Click the Open in New Window item. Notice that the American Memory page appears in a separate window. The second Navigator window even has a separate button in the taskbar here. Look this over, then close the second window by clicking its Close button in the title bar. Thanks. Now I want to go to another web page. 
I think I know what the URL is, so this time we'll enter it directly into the location box. Click inside the box, then type the name displayed in the lesson status bar. Now press your enter key to go to the web page. Here we go again. This error message is a little different from the previous one we saw. It means Navigator can't find the server at all. This could mean that the server really doesn't exist or that it's just really busy. In this case, I gave you the wrong URL so it really doesn't exist. Look it over, then click the OK button. Let's try again. Type in the correct URL, then press Enter. Hmm. This is taking quite a while. The internet must be pretty busy right now, which can really slow things down. Let's wait a few moments. You know, one reason this page took so long is that it contains a large picture, also referred to as an image. Image files are usually pretty big and can take a lot of time to transfer. If you don't care about seeing all the pretty pictures, Navigator lets you turn off the transfer of images. Let's do that. First, click the Edit menu. The Preferences item lets you customize various features of Navigator and the Communicator package as a whole. Click it now. The left side of the Preferences dialog box displays different categories of features. Right now, the right side is displaying the features for the Browser category. For example, here is where you can tell Navigator which document is displayed when you first connect to the Internet. It's also the document that's displayed whenever you click the Home button. Now click the Advanced category on the left. The first option in this category tells Navigator to always transfer the pictures that are part of a document. You can turn off all images by removing this check mark. Do that now by clicking inside the box. Since the lesson screen won't display the entire dialog box, I'll move it up. Now click the OK button. From now on, Navigator won't transfer the pictures that are part of a document. Let's try out this new configuration. Click inside the location box. Now type in the URL for the University of Colorado, then press Enter. That was fast, but this page looks a little weird without the graphics, doesn't it? These are the placeholders for the images that weren't transferred. Now look in the toolbar. The Images button tells Navigator to go ahead and load the pictures for just the current document. Let's try it out. Click it now. That looks better, even though it took a while. By the way, the Images button only appears on the toolbar when the Auto Load Images feature is turned off. Now that you understand about loading images, let's turn the Auto Load feature back on. Follow the instructions in the Lesson Status Bar. Good job! While we're here, let me point out a few other ways you can customize Navigator, as well as the Communicator package in general. Click the Appearance category. This page lets you determine which program is launched when you double-click the Netscape Communicator icon on the desktop. As you can see, Netscape Navigator is automatically chosen. This section lets you control how the toolbar buttons appear on all program windows within Communicator. When you open up your real Navigator program, you might want to bring up the Preferences box and look at all these options. The Help button explains each option. Look this over, then click OK. Well, I hope you enjoyed our brief tour of the web. Please close the Navigator window, then click to move on to the lesson review. Now let's review what you've learned. Click when you're ready to begin.
This concludes our lesson on the World Wide Web. As you probably gathered, we just scratched the surface of one tiny strand of the web. You can literally spend hours wandering around the web, finding some truly amazing stuff. Now that you know the basics for working with Navigator, who knows where you'll travel? In the next lesson, you'll learn how to send and receive email messages using Communicator's electronic mail program called Netscape Messenger. Until then, happy surfing. Welcome to Lesson 4. In this lesson, you're going to learn a great way to communicate with other people on the Internet, electronic mail, or email as most people call it. Specifically, you'll learn just what email is. Then we'll bring up Communicator's mail program, called Netscape Messenger, and you'll learn how to send an email message, as well as read messages that have been sent to you. We'll reply to a message and even attach a document to a message. You'll also learn how to use an address book for people you email frequently. Finally, we'll take a look at some of the mail options you can change. Look over the lesson topics and then click the mouse when you're ready to continue. Email is a high-tech way to send and receive messages across the Internet. Here's how it works. When you subscribe to an Internet provider, you automatically get an email account. An email account is like a chunk of space on your provider's computer used to store and send messages. Your provider uses a special program called a mail server to send and receive your email messages. Look this over, then click to continue. Once you have an email account, the only other thing you need is your own software to work with email messages. There are lots of mail programs, and most Internet providers give you one when you subscribe. Communicator comes with its own mail program called Netscape Messenger, which contains loads of great features for sending and receiving email. Look over the screen, and then we'll get into the Messenger. We're going to start from the Windows 95 desktop in this lesson because I want to show you several ways you can run Netscape Messenger. The first is through the Programs menu in the Start menu. Please click the Start button now. I'll highlight the Programs item and the Netscape Communicator item. Now if you recall from Lesson 2, these are the major components of Communicator. Here is Netscape Messenger, the mail program. If you choose this item, just the mail program will be opened, not Netscape Navigator, and you won't be prompted to connect to the Internet until you try to send or receive messages. Instead of launching the mail program from here, we're going to run it from within Netscape Navigator. Many people like to have both their web browser and mail programs running at the same time, so Communicator has set up an easy way to work with both. First, close all the menus by clicking the Start button. Since you learned how to open Navigator from the desktop in Lesson 2, I won't talk you through it. Just follow the instructions in the Lesson Status Bar. Here's the Navigator window. There are several ways we can open up the mail program from here. First, click the Communicator menu. The top part of this menu lists the major components of Communicator. The Messenger mailbox item brings up the mail program. Now, I'm not trying to stall or anything, but we're not going to open the mail program from here either. Look over the menu and then close it by clicking Communicator again. Now, look on the far right side of the Navigator status bar. Remember the component bar? Go ahead and expand it by clicking this part of the bar. The Navigator button brings up another Navigator browser window. The Mailbox button represents the mail program. This button brings up Communicator's program to work with news groups or discussion groups. And this button launches the Composer to build your own web page. OK, this time we're actually going to open the mail program. Click the Mailbox button now. When you first open up the mail program, Netscape will check your server for any new messages. But before that happens, it needs to know your password. This is generally the same password that your Internet provider assigns you for connecting to the Internet. I'll type in my password now. Now, click the OK button. Navigator checked my provider's mail server for messages. It tells us here in the Mail Window status bar that there were not any new messages. Darn. It's always nice to find mail waiting. Notice that the mail program opens up in a separate window from Navigator. The mail window has its own title bar, menu bar, and toolbar. 
Let's make the screen a little less cluttered. First, put the component bar back on the status bar by clicking its close button. Now, maximize the mail window. As I mentioned earlier, mail messages that you've sent and received live on your computer, not on your server's computer. Your computer has five mail folders. The one we're looking at now is my inbox folder, which contains messages that I previously retrieved from my server. Since the inbox folder is currently selected, headers for all of its messages are listed in the top pane of the window, and the actual content of the highlighted message is currently displayed in the lower pane. If you want to hide the message content of the highlighted message, you can click this triangle. Go ahead and click it. If I had a huge list of received messages, it would be easier to read all their headers this way. Look this over, then click this triangle to redisplay the message contents. Since I like receiving mail, maybe I better send a message to someone and hope that she replies. I'm going to send a message to my friend Jean to see if she can go sailing this weekend. Go ahead and click the New Message button in the toolbar. This is the composition window, where you write your email messages. First, we need to enter the email address of the person who will receive the message. We can either type in the person's email address, or we can select one from our address book here. I haven't added Jean to my address book yet, so we'll have to type in her email address. Please type in the address displayed in the lesson status bar. By the way, this is just a pretend email address. Now press your tab key to move down. You should always include a subject so that the person getting the message has a clue to what the message is about. Type in the subject, then press tab. Now the insertion point is in the message area. There are several ways to enter information here. You can simply type a message, or you can copy information from another document using the copy and paste items. This time, I'll type in the message. Are you impressed with my speedy typing skills? By the way, if you make a typo or want to change the message body, use your arrow keys or mouse to move around the message and change it. If you're familiar with word processing programs, this toolbar might look familiar. It enables you to format your message in various ways. When you're finished with the message, you have a few options. You can send it immediately using the Send button, or you can place the message in the Unsent Messages folder to send later. Click the File menu, and I'll show you. If you click this item, you can send the message later by clicking an item in the File menu of the regular mail program. Look this over, and then close the menu by clicking File again. Finally, if you're not finished with the message and want to come back to it later, you can click the Save button. It saves the message in a folder called Drafts. Later, you can open up that folder and finish the message. We're going to send this message immediately, so please click the Send button. That's it. The message has been sent. It will be available to Jean to read in just a few minutes. She can read it the next time she connects to the Internet and checks her messages. Once you send a message, the mail program puts the message into a folder called Sent. Let's take a look at it. Click anywhere inside the Folders box. Here's the Sent folder, but before we look at it, let me quickly explain the other folders. The Unsent Messages folder contains messages that you've specified to be sent later. The Drafts folder contains messages you're still working on. And the Trash folder contains messages that you've deleted. Finally, the Samples folder contains sample email messages using HTML formatting. Go ahead and click the Sent folder. Here's the message. As you can see, this pane shows the subject of the message, who received it, and when the message was sent. The content of the highlighted message is displayed in the lower pane. Look this over, and then we'll continue with the lesson. A business associate of mine sent me a message yesterday, which I read. However, I'd like to read it again and reply to it now. Click inside the Folders box. Now click the Inbox folder. Here's the message. Please click it. The message is displayed down below. To read more of the message, you can use the scroll bars. 
Look this over, then click inside the scroll bar. Before we reply to this message, I want to point out a few mail features. To delete a mail message, you just click the message in the top pane, then click the delete button. You can print out a hard copy of the message by clicking the print button. And this button allows you to forward a copy of this mail message to someone else. The file button lets you move the current message into a different folder, such as the unsent messages folder. Finally, if you want to check your mail server for any new messages, you can use the get message button. Look these over and then click to continue. The reply button offers several ways to reply to this message without creating a brand new message. Go ahead and click it now. The first item sends the reply to just the person who wrote the message. The second item sends the reply to everyone who received this message. Click the first item. Notice that Netscape automatically entered the email address of the person who originally sent the message. It's also displaying another to field, in case you want to send this reply to someone else as well. The subject field is also filled in, and the RE prefix means that we're replying to the original subject. Netscape also automatically entered a copy of the original message at the top of the message area. This feature is helpful sometimes, but if you don't want this to happen, you can turn off the feature using the Preferences dialog box. We'll look at that box in a little while. We can type our reply either above the original message or below it. It's a matter of personal taste. Press Enter to type it above. Now, press your up arrow key to move the insertion point up. I'll go ahead and type the reply. You might be wondering how I can send a copy of a letter along with an email message. Well, Netscape cleverly lets me do that. I'll show you. First, click the Attach button. Any piece of information that's stored as a file can be attached to an email message. You can also attach an internet address, which enables the recipient to view an internet document. In either case, depending on the recipient's mail program, the person receiving the email can either view the file or the internet document as part of the email message, or bring it up as a separate file or link. Look this over, then click the file item. Next, type in the full path name of the file we'll be attaching. Good. Now click Open. Notice that the Attachment tab is selected and the file name is listed. The last thing we need to do is send the message. Since we're attaching a letter, it will take a little longer to send. This letter is particularly large because it contains some graphics. Netscape will give a progress report as it sends the letter. Please click the Send button now. Great, my reply is on the way. When we first created an email message, you might recall that we had the option of entering the recipient's email address using an address book. Click the New Message button and I'll show you. Now click the Address book. This list contains the addresses of people I email frequently. For example, instead of typing in Paul's address every time, I can just click it here and then click the To button. Let's add my friend Gene to the address book. We're not going to send a message right now, so just look this over and then close both windows. First, click the Communicator menu. Next, click the Address Book item. Here's my list of email addresses. Click the New Card button to add Gene's address. Here's where we add Gene's name and email address. The other tabs let us enter lots of other information about Gene. Follow the instructions to fill in the fields. Good. Now click the OK button. Here is Gene's entry. The next time we bring up the address book list from the message composition window, we can select it. Go ahead and close this window. Before wrapping up this lesson, I want to point out a few mail options available to you. First, click Add it in the menu bar. Next, click the Preferences item. This box is the same as the one we saw during the World Wide Web lesson. 
Notice that the Mail and Groups category is currently selected and its subcategories are displayed. Click on the Identity subcategory. You use this sheet to tell Netscape your name and email address if it ever changes. Now click the Messages subcategory. This sheet lets you control how messages are sent and received. For example, this option tells Netscape to quote the original message when replying. Look it over, then click the Mail Server subcategory. If you ever change Internet service providers, you'll need to enter the address of the new provider's mail servers here. This information was originally entered when you installed Netscape Communicator. Look this over and then close the Preferences box. Now please close the mail window. And we're back to the Navigator browser window. Please close it. Well, that about wraps up our tour of Netscape Messenger. Now click anywhere to move on to the lesson review. It's time to review what you've learned about email. Click when you're ready to begin. This concludes Lesson 4. Now that you understand the basic features of Communicator's mail program, I'm sure you'll enjoy interacting with friends and associates across the Internet. And you might want to explore some of Netscape Messenger's more advanced features, such as attaching URLs to a message. In the next lesson, you'll learn how to get involved with news groups using Netscape Collabora. Until then, goodbye. Welcome to Lesson 5. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to communicate with special interest groups on the Internet, referred to as news groups or discussion groups. Specifically, you'll learn what Usenet news groups are. Then we'll bring up Communicator's news group program called Netscape Calabra. You'll learn how to access your news server's list of news groups and how to subscribe to some of them. We'll open up a news group and you'll see how news group articles are organized. Then you'll read an article and reply to it. Finally, we'll look at some options for customizing your news program. Look over the lesson topics, then click anywhere to continue. How would you like to be able to locate thousands of people who share a similar interest and then communicate with all of them almost instantly? That's what Usenet news groups offer. News groups allow you to send and receive messages among people sharing an interest. They're similar to the forums and rooms found on commercial online services like CompuServe and America Online. So exactly how do news groups work? If you recall from previous lessons, computers on the Internet can store information in various forms, such as web pages. Another form is a news group, which is a vehicle for distributing messages among anyone accessing the group. The entire collection of news groups on the Internet is referred to as Usenet. Look over the screen, then click the mouse when you're ready to continue. Each news group has a URL, just as web pages do. But as you'll see, news groups don't really work like web pages. Here are a few examples of news group URLs. The first part of the URL is the protocol, which is always news. The next section is the name of the news group itself. News group names generally follow a naming convention, which helps you understand what the names represent. This convention uses several levels. The first level often represents a general news category, such as technical, recreational, or alternative. The next level of the news group name usually gives the primary subject area, and many groups have a third level which breaks the subject of the group into more specialized areas, such as rec.autos.antique, for people interested in old cars. Look this over, then click to continue. When you access a news group, you actually go through a news server, such as your Internet Service Provider's server. A news server is special software that automatically collects and distributes news messages across Usenet. In some ways, the news server is like the mail server, which you learned about earlier in the course. Just as your own computer needs an email program to send and receive email, your computer needs a news program to access news groups. Communicator comes with an excellent news program called Netscape Calabra. Communicator refers to news groups as discussion groups, so you'll often see that term when you get into the program.
Look over the screen and then we'll access Calabra. As you know by now, you can launch individual components of Communicator from either the Programs menu or from any other Communicator program, such as Navigator. In the previous lesson, we launched the Mail program from within Navigator. This time, we're going to open the Netscape Calabra program from the Programs menu. Before we do, let's go ahead and connect to the Internet. Although Calabra would prompt us to do that later, we'll do it now to save time. Double-click my Internet Providers icon. Now click the Connect button. Please minimize the Connect window. Great. Now we're ready to launch Calabra. Click the Start button. I'll get us to the Netscape Communicator menu. Click the Netscape Calabra item to launch the Newsgroups program. What you see now is called the Message Center. This is like a central point for all your mail folders and groups. This item represents the news server I'm currently using. It happens to be my Internet Provider's news server, but it doesn't have to be. You can access different news servers if you want. Later, I'll show you where to do that. So, where are the news groups? Well, right now there aren't any listed in the Message Center, because I haven't subscribed to any yet. Subscribing to a news group just means it's added to this window, so that you can access it whenever you want. Let's subscribe to a couple of news groups. Click the Subscribe button. The very first time Netscape accesses your news server, it takes a while to download all of the news server's discussion groups. So if you see this empty box for a long time, don't worry. After a few minutes, it will fill up with discussion groups like this. Netscape just accessed my provider's news server and is now displaying the list of news groups offered by that server. Keep in mind that not every news group is on every server. The discussion groups are organized by category, or rather by the first section of their names. For example, all the groups beginning with ACS are contained within this folder. An entry like this represents a single news group. Look this over and then click anywhere to continue. Rather than scroll forever through this list, let's search for some news groups. I want to find out if there are any news groups about skiing. Click this tab. Typing a word in the Search For box brings up a list of news groups whose URL contains that word. Type the word Skiing. Next, click the Search Now button. This backcountry group looks interesting. To subscribe to it, you just click on it and then click the Subscribe button. Please do that now. Sometimes you might actually know the entire name of a news group you'd like to subscribe to. If that's the case, you can type its name in here to search or go back to the All Groups sheet. I just heard about a great music news group. Let's subscribe to it using the All Groups sheet. Please click its tab now. Next, type in the news group name, which is rec.music.beatles. Watch the news group display change as you type in each letter. Good. Now click the Subscribe button. Next, we need to click the OK button to add both news groups to our list. Right now, you can't see the lower part of the dialog box, so I'll move it up. Now click the OK button. And we're back at the Message Center. To see the subscribed news groups, click the plus sign next to the news server. Now you can see the news groups we just subscribed to. Let's open up the Beatles group and see what's happening. Double click it now. What you see now is a message from Netscape. Since there are so many messages in this news group, it wants to know if we want all the message headers downloaded. I think 500 will be enough, so click 500 headers. Next, click the download button and then watch the Netscape status bar. My news server found the news group and downloaded the headers for the first 500 messages. 
News messages are also referred to as articles. As you can see, the headers and messages appear in a window separate from the message center. It's called the discussion window. Notice that some of the message headers have plus signs next to them. That means that people have replied to that message. Click the plus sign next to this message. This message is a reply to this message. And notice that the first reply even has its own set of replies. By the way, messages that are grouped along with the replies are referred to as threaded messages. Just a little terminology tidbit for you. Click inside the scroll bar to see some more headers. While this seems to be a popular topic, I'll scroll back up to the original message. To read a message, you just click on its header. Click the original message in this thread. The message is now displayed in the lower pane. Look this over, and then let's look at a reply. When you're ready, click this reply. The reply is now in the lower pane. By the way, the names and email addresses of newsgroup users have been disguised throughout the course to protect the uh, innocent. Scroll down the message once. Notice that the original message appears first. That's handy for people who want to pick up on what's going on. This is a feature that you can control through the Preferences box, which you'll see later. Look this over, and then click when you're ready to continue. The great thing about newsgroups is that you can do more than just read messages. You can reply to them and even post your own articles so that other people can reply. The buttons in the toolbar let you do all these things. I'll quickly go over some of them with you. The first button downloads the next 500 message headers for this newsgroup, or any new messages that have come in. The next button lets you post a new article to the displayed newsgroup. That means anyone accessing the newsgroup can read it and reply to it. Although we won't post an article, go ahead and click the New Message button. This looks a lot like the message composition window from the mail program, doesn't it? You just enter a subject here, write the message down here, and click here to send. Look it over, then close the window. The third button lets you reply to the current message instead of posting a new article. As you'll see in a moment, there are several ways to reply to a message. The next two buttons serve the same purpose as they do in the mail program. You can forward a message to someone and file the message in a different folder. This button jumps to the next unread message. And this button lets you mark certain groups of messages as read. Look over the screen, then click to continue. Let's reply to the original message in this thread. First, click on its header. Now, click the Reply button. Now we have some choices. We can either send a reply that the entire newsgroup can read, or we can email a reply to just the author of the message, or we can do both. Click the Reply to Group item. All the necessary information has been filled in for us. Notice that the insertion point is blinking at the top of the original message. We'll type the reply up there. First, press Enter. Next, press your up arrow key. Now, I'll type in the reply. There. Now you send the reply. It'll take a while for our reply to appear in the news group. News articles are a little slower than email messages. Before we leave, I want to show you how you can customize the Netscape Collabora program. Your choices are similar to the email options. Click the Edit menu. Now click the Preferences item. You've already seen the Preferences box in previous lessons. Click the Group Server subcategory on the left. This is the news server I'm currently using. If you ever want to use a different news server, you just enter the name in here. Look this over, and then click the Messages subcategory. If you recall from the email lesson, this option tells Netscape to display the original message whenever you're replying to a message. Look it over, then close the Preferences box. Now please close the discussion window. Before we leave, I want to point out a quick way to remove a news group from your subscription list. Let's get rid of the backcountry skiing group. First, click your right mouse button where the red arrow is pointing. Now click the Remove Discussion Group item. 
Click OK. Very good. Now you can close the Message Center window. That about wraps up our tour of news groups. Once you start experimenting with reading and replying to messages, you'll quickly get the hang of it. Click the mouse when you're ready to move on to the lesson review. Now let's review what you've learned about news groups. Click to begin. This concludes Lesson 5. Remember, whether you need help figuring out the right drill bit to use or want to learn more about tropical fish, there's probably a news group out there waiting for you. In the next lesson, you'll learn how to get even more information from the net by visiting FTP and Gopher sites. See you then. Welcome to Lesson 6. In this lesson, we're going to look at two more ways you can get to the vast amount of information on the Internet, FTP and Gopher sites. Specifically, you'll learn just what these two creatures are. Then we'll use Netscape Navigator to access an FTP site, and you'll see how to download a file. I'll also give you a quick explanation of Netscape's helper applications, and how they can help you to work with information on the net. We'll visit a cool Gopher site, which should give you a flavor of how to wander around Gopher space. Finally, I'll show you how you can save a Gopher document on your computer. Look over the topics, then click anywhere to continue. If you recall from previous lessons, computers on the Internet store information in different ways. Web pages offer spectacular graphics and the ability to link to other places on the Internet. News groups offer a way to communicate with groups of people sharing an interest. FTP sites and Gopher sites are just two more ways to store and access information on the Net. Let's start with FTP, which stands for File Transfer Protocol. FTP sites are basically storage places for files that can be transferred directly to your computer. You don't generally view these files while you're online, unlike web pages. The primary purpose of an FTP site is to allow people to download and upload files, such as game programs or utilities for their computers. Downloading is another word for transferring a file to your computer from another computer. Uploading means sending a file from your computer to another computer. You can use Netscape Navigator to download files from FTP sites. But if you ever want to upload a file to an FTP site, you'll need to use another FTP program, such as Qt FTP. By the way, you don't necessarily have to go to an FTP site to download a file from the Internet. Many web pages, such as Netscape's General Store page, have download links. When you click on one of these links, the appropriate file is automatically downloaded to your computer. Look over the screen, then click to continue. As you'll see in a moment, the structure of an FTP site is very similar to the structure of your own computer's file management system, such as the Windows 95 Explorer. Files are stored in folders or directories within sections of a specific Internet computer. To locate a file, you need to know the name of the computer and the name of its FTP site. In other words, it's URL. Look this over and click to continue. Here is a typical FTP site URL. The protocol name FTP always appears first. The remaining part shows the name of the computer and the section of the computer housing the FTP site. This is usually called FTP also, but it doesn't have to be. Most FTP sites store files in directories, so directory names can also be added to the URL. Look this over and then click to continue. Gopher sites are kind of like a cross between an FTP site and a web page. Gopher sites contain files in a hierarchical format, like FTP sites, but you can generally view the contents of those files, like web pages. Unlike web pages, however, most Gopher documents don't contain all the fancy features that a web page does, such as graphics and animation. They generally contain just text. Gopher URLs follow the same rules as other URLs. The protocol is Gopher, followed by the name of the computer and the section housing the Gopher site. If you're wondering where the term Gopher came from, well, here's the story. The Gopher system was invented by a group of creative individuals at the University of Minnesota, whose mascot is the Golden Gopher. Get it? Also, the term Gopher is appropriate because the purpose of the Gopher system is to go for information. All Gopher sites on the net are collectively referred to as Gopher Space. Look this over, and then we'll board the navigator. We'll begin from Netscape's homepage. 
Just as your computer needs special programs to browse web pages and work with email, it needs special programs to visit FTP and Gopher sites. Netscape Navigator comes with these programs, but you don't have to do anything to make them work. They're automatically activated when you access an FTP or Gopher site. We'll start by visiting an FTP site. There are several ways to get to FTP sites. Often, if a specific web page offers some sort of downloading capability, then the page contains a link directly to the FTP site. Or, if you know the name of the FTP site you want, you can just enter its URL using the location box. Or, if you don't know the URL and want some listings and links to sites, you can use some of the Internet's search tools. Later in the course, you'll learn about these search tools. Look over the screen and then click when you're ready to continue. Let's go directly to an FTP site that offers some cool programs, which are free, of course. Click inside the location box. Since we're opening an FTP site, the protocol needs to be entered first. Please type it in. Now, please type the rest of the URL, displayed in the lesson status bar. Finally, press your Enter key. Oh boy, we seem to have the worst luck, don't we? As you can see on the screen, this FTP site is too busy to accept any more connections. But I know a little trick. Usually, a connection opens up pretty quickly. So if we try to connect to the site again right away, we could get in. Since the URL is still in the location box and the cursor is blinking there, pressing the Enter key will tell Navigator to try again. Please press Enter now. Told you it would work. As you can see, WinSite is the planet's largest software archive for Windows. This is a great place to download free software. Read this over, and then click inside the scroll bar to see the rest of the page. Notice that the folders and files within the FTP site are listed. Folders, or directories, are represented by this icon, and files are represented by this icon. The Mirrors file contains a list of FTP sites that have the same files as this FTP site. These duplicate sites are called Mirror Sites. Mirror Sites are handy because if the original FTP site is too busy to handle any requests, you can access one of its Mirror Sites and get the file you need. Look over the screen and then click to continue. The top part of this document mentioned that Windows 95 software is in the pub slash pc slash win95 directory. Let's check it out. Click this folder. Now scroll down twice and click the PC folder. Finally, scroll down and click the Win95 folder. At last! Actually, there's a shortcut to clicking your way through folders like we just did. When you type in the URL in the location box, you can include the complete path name of the directory you want if you know what it is. Look in the location box. We could have typed in this entire URL to go straight to this page. Now scroll down twice. I want to find some nice backgrounds to use in my Windows 95 desktop. The index entry is handy because it lists all the software contained in this directory. So rather than scrolling through all the folders, we could just read the index to see what's here. But I'd rather scroll down and see some of the folders myself. Click inside the scroll bar. I think that the desktop folder is the one we want for backgrounds. Go ahead and click it. Read this over and then scroll down until you find an index. Here's the index for the desktop directory. Let's use it to see if there are some backgrounds here. Click the index file now. If you recall, a quick way to locate something on a document is to use Navigator's Find feature. Let's try to find anything on this page with the word background in it. First, click the Edit menu. Next, click the Find in Page item. Next, type in Background, and then click the Find Next button. Hmm, not quite what I want. Click Find Next again. This looks good. Go ahead and close the Find dialog box.
I'd like to download this file, but we can't do it from the index. We need to back up to the desktop directory where the file is actually located. Click the Back button. Now scroll down until you find bdrop200.zip. The .zip at the end of the file means this file is compressed. After we download it, we need to use a special program to decompress it. But what if our computer doesn't have that special program? In a moment, I'll explain one option. To download this file, we just click on it. Please do this now. The message you see now is from Navigator. Read it over and then I'll explain. Just click anywhere when you're ready to continue. First, Navigator wants you to be aware of certain security risks you take when downloading files. It also wants to know if you want to open the file immediately or just save it on your computer. If you choose the Save option, it will stay on your computer. You can then open it and work with it when you want. If you choose the Open option, Navigator will attempt to open up the file using the program that's associated with it. So, how does Navigator know which program to use to open the file? Look up at the top of the box. My computer contains a program called WinZip32. When I installed that program, it automatically associated it with all files ending in the extension zip. Navigator is smart enough to find that association, so it knows to use that program to open up this file. Look over the screen for a moment, and then click anywhere to continue. But what if we try to download a file type that Navigator doesn't recognize? For example, suppose my computer didn't have a WinZip program. If that were the case, we would see this message from Navigator. We could still save the file on my computer, but Navigator wouldn't be able to open it until we installed an application to run it. Navigator actually comes with some applications called helper applications that enable you to open many types of files. Clicking the More Info button would give you more information about it. Look this over and then click anywhere to continue. Here's the message we actually got from Navigator this time. We want to save the file on my computer, so click the OK button. Now Navigator wants to know where to save the file on my computer and what name to give it. We'll use the default values that it provides. Look over the dialog box, then click Save. Since this file is pretty small, it won't take long to download. There, the file is now on my computer. Later, I can go and decompress it and then create a new background. Look over the screen again and then click the mouse when you're ready to move on. Now let's take a quick visit to a Gopher site. You access Gopher Space pretty much the same way as you access FTP sites, linking from a web page, typing in a URL, or locating sites using various search tools. We'll type in a URL, but this time we'll use the open page box. Follow the instructions below. Next, type in the URL displayed in the lesson status bar and then click open. Here we are at the Gopher site for the Library of Congress. Gopher documents can be accessed through various menus and directories, kind of like FTP sites. But unlike FTP files, you can actually view the information online. If you recall, we visited the website for the library earlier in the course. This gives you a chance to compare a website to a Gopher site. Look over the menu and then click this folder. Now scroll down to see some of the files. The history file looks interesting. Go ahead and click it. This document describes the history of the Library of Congress. Look this over and then scroll down once. Notice that the document consists of just text, meaning there are just words and no graphics. Most Gopher documents look like this, although some Gopher documents are pictures. But in order to view a picture in a Gopher site, you need to have the right viewer. A viewer is just a program that lets you view a certain type of information, such as a picture in JPEG format. I won't bog you down with details, because Navigator comes with most of the viewers that you need to view Gopher documents. It's just something to be aware of. Look this over, and then click to continue. You can save Gopher documents the same way you save web pages, through the Save As item in the File menu. Although we did this during the World Wide Web lesson, I'll quickly refresh your memory. First, click the File menu. Next, click Save As. 
We won't follow through with this, but you just choose the folder you want to contain the document, give the document a name, and choose the file type, then click Save. Look this over, then click Cancel. While we're finished wandering around Gopher Space, please close the navigator window. Now click anywhere to move on to the lesson review. Let's review what you've learned about FTP sites and Gopher Space. Click to begin. This concludes Lesson 6. Now that you know two more ways to get information from the Internet, your computer will soon be overflowing. If you're not sure where to start looking for FTP and Gopher sites, stay tuned for Lesson 7. In that lesson, I'll tell you about some of the Internet search tools available. See you then. Welcome to Lesson 7. In this lesson, we're going to look at a few tools you can use to search for various information on the Net. Specifically, we'll access Netscape Navigator's Net Search page, which offers a variety of search tools. You'll learn how to use two popular search tools, InfoSeq and Yahoo. We'll search for web pages related to a specific topic, and also search for newsgroup articles. We'll check out a tool called Archie, which is used to locate FTP sites. And then I'll show you how to use Veronica, a search tool for Gopher Space. Look over the topics and then click anywhere to continue. We'll begin from Navigator's browser window. Although it's certainly fun to surf the net just to see where various links take you, often you'll want to look for something in particular. Where is the web page for that hot new company you've heard so much about? What are people saying about that controversial movie? Which FTP sites have a good selection of free software? There are so many search tools available on the Internet, it would be impossible to cover them all here. But Netscape has its own search pages, which offer links to the most popular search tools. Click the Guide button. This menu provides links to popular Internet guides, as well as specific search tools. For example, the People item brings up a list of tools used to search for people and organizations on the Internet. It's a good place to go to find someone's email address. The Search button in the toolbar contains the most popular general-purpose search tools. We're going to work with the search page. First, remove the Guide menu by pressing the Escape key on your keyboard. Now click the Search button. Here's the Net Search page. Netscape has recognized four premier search tools, represented by these links. Each of these links provides a sampler of the search tool to give you a general idea of how each one works. The InfoSeq search tool is currently displayed, but Netscape constantly rotates the display among these four tools. You can add a link to your favorite search page here, and even specify which sampler is automatically displayed. To display another sample yourself, just click its tab. Click the Yahoo tab. Now we could use Yahoo to start a search. We'll come back to it later in the lesson. The search page offers other links to valuable search tools. Scroll down the page by clicking inside the scroll bar. These are some of the best search tools on the Internet. For example, Yahoo was one of the first search tools on the Internet. Let's use the InfoSeq search tool. Click its link when you're ready. InfoSeq offers many ways to search for information. For example, you can enter a topic to search for here, and even select which areas of the net to search, such as the World Wide Web. I want to find some neat places on the World Wide Web about the Stock Exchange. Click inside the search box and type American Stock Exchange. Good, now click the Seek button. Well, judging by this message, it looks as though InfoSeq would like to be my default search tool on the Net Search page. I like rotating among search tools, so I won't take them up on their offer. 
This page contains our search results. Scroll down twice using your page down key. Right now, this page contains the 10 items that most closely match the phrase American Stock Exchange. Most items contain a link going directly to the related web page, so you can go right there from here. Go ahead and scroll down to the last link on the page using your page down key. You might have noticed that this page contains several links to the American Stock Exchange site. Each link represents a different page within the same site. If we wanted to see the next 10 items, we could click here. But let's go back up a couple of pages. Press your page up key twice. Let's visit the home page of the American Stock Exchange site. Please click this link. This looks nice. Although I'd like to spend some time here, let's go back to InfoSeek and search for some newsgroup articles. Instead of using the back button, we'll use the history list. First, click the Go menu. If you recall, the history list displays the most recent documents that we visited. Click number 2, InfoSeek. And we're back. This box lets you pick certain areas of the Internet to search. Please click the drop-down button. Choosing the Usenet News Groups item tells InfoSeek to find news articles within news groups. It doesn't actually search for the news groups themselves. Please click it. Okay, what should we search for? I don't know about you, but I'm a big science fiction fan, my favorite author being Isaac Asimov. There are some interesting news groups that like to discuss Asimov's works. Let's look at some recent articles. I'll clear out the search box. Now, please type his name in lowercase letters. Finally, click the Seek button. Now, press your page down key. Again, the 10 most relevant articles are listed first. Clicking this link displays the article. And here is the news group posting this article. This is the email address of the person posting the article. Just as in other lessons, we've changed the real addresses appearing on this page. Look this over and then click the first article. Here's the top of the article. Notice that it appears inside Navigator's web browser instead of Calabra's news window. All links within InfoSeek are displayed inside the web browser. Now press your page down key. Here's the content of the article. Read it over if you want, and then click anywhere to continue. Now let's move on and see how to search for FTP sites. Click the search button to bring up a new copy of the net search page. The Internet has a special tool specifically designed to search FTP sites. It's called Archie, but you won't find it listed on Netscape's search page. Various forms of Archie live all over the Internet, and we need to go directly to a server providing Archie. But how do we know where to go? Well, we can use one of these search tools to help us find Archie. So as bizarre as it sounds, we need to use a search tool to find a search tool. We're going to use Yahoo this time. Click the Yahoo tab. Click inside the search box and type Archie. Now click the search button. Here's Yahoo's search results page. Archie provides links to both categories and actual sites. Scroll down to see the three categories. The first category is the one we want. Click it now. Now scroll down to view the individual links. Here's a good RT server. Look over the page, then click it. Archie is used to search for specific files and directories at FTP sites. Read this over and then scroll down using the scroll bar until you reach the Archie server box. This box lists other Archie servers that you can use for your search. You should be aware, however, that each Archie server is a little different. I've noticed that different Archie servers can produce different results even when I'm using the same search topic. 
That's something to keep in mind. The next section lets you tell Archie how to search. Archie will find any file or directory whose name contains the word you enter, or it will match your search word exactly. I want to search for a chess game to download. If we use this search option, Archie will find all files and directories that contain the word chess. Go ahead and click inside that option. Now scroll down once. Next, click inside the search term box and type chess. Now click the Start Search button to begin the search. Archie takes a while, but I'll speed up the process. Here we go. This page lists the FTP sites containing files or directories that have the word chess in them. Go ahead and scroll down. This is a link to the chess game file itself. If you clicked this link now, the file would automatically be downloaded to your computer. You wouldn't have to access the FTP site to download it. This is a link to the FTP site that contains the chess file. And this is a link to the directory within the FTP site that contains the file. Sometimes it's nice to visit the FTP site or directory to see what else is offered. Since you learned how to download files and work with FTP sites earlier in the course, we won't go any further. Look over the page and then return to the Net Search page using the Go menu. Just as FTP sites have Archie, GopherSpace has a search tool called Veronica. Veronica is similar to Archie except that it just searches Gopher sites for information. Again, there are many Veronica servers on the Internet, so you can use Yahoo to locate them. Follow the instructions in the lesson status bar to do this. This time we're going to use one of Yahoo's site links instead of a category link. Click inside the scroll bar until you see the list of Veronica server links. Let's try this one. Please click it. Well, this looks simple enough, doesn't it? The Library of Congress site we visited earlier in the course was interesting. Let's find some more government gopher sites. Click inside the search box and type government. Now press your Enter key to begin the search. And here's a list of Gopher directories and files relating to the government. You might want to try this search on your own system sometime. There's a real goldmine of information in government Gopher space. Look this over and then click to continue. Well, I'm about searched out, aren't you? Go ahead and close down Navigator and then click to move on to the lesson review. Let's review what you've learned about the Internet's search tools. Click anywhere to begin. This concludes Lesson 7. We've really just scratched the surface of using Internet search tools. I encourage you to experiment with the various search links that Navigator offers in its search pages. Once you find a few you like, you'll be able to find almost anything on the net. In the next lesson, we'll see how Netscape Navigator enables you to take advantage of some popular features on the World Wide Web. Until then, goodbye. Welcome to Lesson 8. In this lesson, we're going to use Netscape Navigator to explore some of the greatest features on the World Wide Web. Specifically, you'll learn how you can enter information into some web pages using forms. We'll take a look at an innovative way to arrange web page information called frames. We'll also visit some web pages that have incorporated animation and interactivity using a unique program called Java. And you'll learn how Netscape Navigator enables you to listen to sounds on web pages using various plugins. Finally, I'll briefly tell you about Netscape Netcaster, which enables you to have web pages delivered automatically to your computer. Look over the lesson topics and then click anywhere on the screen to continue. Let's start by looking at forms. A form is simply a web page that allows you to enter information, such as your name and address, which can then be transferred to other places. Netscape Navigator provides outstanding support for forms. 
you've already worked with a couple of forms during this course. The search tools we explored in the previous lesson consist of small forms in which you enter your search words and then click a search button. And the message composition windows we saw while working with email and news groups are considered forms. Many sites on the web offer feedback forms where you can send responses to the website. And a very popular form is the order form which allows you to place orders for products and services instantly over the net. Look over the screen and then click to continue. We're going to visit a site that offers a really nice order form. I've made a bookmark for it, so please click the Bookmarks button. The bookmarks that I've created are in the folder called My Stuff. I'll highlight it now. Now, click the Elvis bookmark. Look this over and then press your Page Down key. Notice that this page gives us a choice between a secure form and a non-secure form. When you use a secure form, the information you enter cannot be taken by anyone else on the Internet. This is an important issue, since so many credit card transactions take place over the net every day. Let's check out the secure order form. Click the Order button. Whenever we link from a non-secure document to a secure one, Netscape gives us this message. You'll notice it again later when we link from a secure document to a non-secure one. Look it over and then click the Continue button. <laughs> wow, this is some graphic. Before we scroll down, I want to point out a couple of things. Notice that the protocol part of the URL now says HTTPS. That means this document is coming from a secure server. And look at the Security button in both the Toolbar and the Status Bar. The picture of the padlock is now locked. You might have noticed before that the padlock was open when we visited a non-secure page. Clicking this button gives you information about this document, such as the type of security certificate it's using. Look this over and then scroll down about five times using your Page Down key. Here we are at the first section of input fields. The first field has a drop-down list attached to it, meaning you can select an item from a list instead of typing it in. Click its button. <laughs> this looks more like a drop-up than a drop-down list. To select an item, we just highlight it and click it. Let's select the last item. Please click it. Here's something to keep in mind. While you're filling in fields, you can't use the Page Down key to scroll down. We won't complete all the fields, but I'm going to scroll down the screen to show you another section. To type information into a field, you first have to click inside it. Click inside the Name field. Now please type in my name. To move to the next field, you can either click inside it or press your Tab key. Pressing Enter won't work. Press your Tab key now. And that's about all there is to completing fields. Just typing information, pressing your tab key, and selecting from a drop-down list. After you've completed a form, you need to click a button that will send the information. I'll scroll down to reach the bottom of the page. Here's the button you click to send the information. Many forms will give you a confirmation message after the information has been sent. Look over the screen and then return to Netscape's home page. Since Netscape's homepage is not a secure document, we see this message. Look it over, then click the Continue button. Although the World Wide Web is a terrific collection of fascinating pages, one drawback is that you can generally view just one page at a time. And when you link from one page to another, it's easy to forget where you are and where you just came from. A design feature called Frames helps to overcome these drawbacks. Frames are simply a way to view more than one web page at a time, and usually one of the web pages is a table of contents. But a picture is worth at least a few hundred words, so let's check out a web page using frames. Look over the screen and then click the Bookmarks button. I'll highlight the My Stuff folder. Please click the Colorado Soccer Net bookmark. What you see now are actually three web pages. Each page is within a frame, and each page has its own URL. The entire collection of frames is referred to as a frame set. A frame set can have a lot of frames. I've seen them contain up to five frames. This site has divided its frame set so that the table of contents appears here. 
and the current topic is here. The third frame just contains a graphic of the CSN logo. Look this over and then scroll down the table of contents frame. Notice that when you clicked inside the frame, a thin black border appeared around it. That means this frame is currently selected. In a moment, I'll show you why you sometimes need to know which frame is selected. Now click the Fields link. The right frame now contains the field information. This setup comes in handy because if you want to link to different areas, you can just scroll through the left frame. Scroll down the left frame and then click the Equipment link. Now the equipment information is in the right frame. If you want to go back and forth among the topics that have already been displayed in this frame, you can use the back and forward buttons in the toolbar. Click the back button. Another way to select the back and forward buttons is by right clicking inside the frame. Click your right mouse button where the arrow is pointing. Let's go forward. Click the forward item. Get the picture? In most web pages, the back and forward items apply to the main frame of information. For example, if you click the back button while the table of contents frame is selected, the main frame here will actually go back, not the table of contents. But it's important to keep in mind that not all web pages with frames work this way. In some web pages, clicking the back button will always affect the frame that's selected regardless of what's in it. The moral of this story is have fun playing around with different web pages with frames in them and expect to be surprised now and then. Look over the screen and then click to continue. Another thing to remember about frames is that some of the menu items apply to just the currently selected frame, not to all the frames. Click the File menu. Notice that several items apply only to the selected frame. For example, if you choose the Save Frame As item right now, only the information in this frame will be saved. Look over the menu, then click File again to close it. One final word about working with frames. Sometimes clicking a link in a frame opens up another entire browser window. I've run into that before and it can be a little confusing if you're not expecting it. If you're using Windows 95, the taskbar will show you if other browser windows are open. Okay, now click the back button twice to return to the top of the main frame. Since you're at the beginning of the frame, clicking the back button again will take you to the previous website. Click it now. Good. Now we'll move on to another exciting web extra. Worldwide web pages can offer beautiful graphics, colorful photographs, and links to thousands of locations in cyberspace. They can also offer animations and interactivity thanks to something called Java. We don't need to get into all the technical details, but basically Java is a programming language that can create programs that can run on any computer. It wasn't developed specifically for the Internet, but soon people developing web pages caught on to Java and thought, hey, we can stick little Java programs on our web pages. A Java program is referred to as a Java applet. Some examples of applets are animated cartoons, text that scrolls across the screen, and a form that analyzes what you enter as you enter it. Not all web browsers can handle web pages with Java applets, but Netscape Navigator can. Look over the screen, and then we'll check out a Java site. There's a great web page that's dubbed itself the Java Directory. It provides links to lots of information about Java, as well as sites using Java applets. Follow the instructions in the lesson status bar to bring it up. I've found a lot of interesting links from the Gamelon website. Although we won't spend too much time here, go ahead and scroll down a few times. Gamelon offers a series of directories you can browse through. You can also search for a particular type of Java applet, such as a game or animation. When I was here earlier, I found a fun Java crossword puzzle. I made a bookmark for it, so let's go ahead and access it. Click the Bookmarks button. I'll highlight the My Stuff folder. Now you click the crossword entry bookmark. The top part of the page provides instructions for the puzzle. Oh, by the way, sometimes when you click a link leading to a Java applet, the applet will appear in a separate browser window. When you're done with the applet, you just close that window and return to your original navigator window. 
Click inside the scroll bar a couple of times and read through the instructions. As I mentioned earlier, Java applets can be developed for animations, moving text, and even interactive games. This crossword puzzle is an interactive game, meaning it can analyze and keep track of the information you enter. Notice that the Netscape status bar tells us that a Java applet is currently running. Let's try one word. Notice that the one across entry is highlighted and the clue is given up top. I have no idea what a goad for driving cattle is, so let's try four across. Click inside the four. Can you guess? I think the answer is crab, but I want to show you how the Java applet can catch a mistake. Type in craf instead of crab. See how the letter F appears in red? You entered a wrong letter, and that's what makes this different from an ordinary form. The Java applet was written to analyze and respond to what you enter. Go ahead and type a B. That's better. I wish we had time to finish this, but I want to move on to another exciting web extra, sound. You can visit this crossword page when you're running your real navigator program. And I'll give you a hint. Even if you disconnect from the Internet, a Java applet attached to a web page that you've already transferred continues to run. So if you don't want to spend time on the Internet, just access this page, disconnect, and then continue playing the crossword. Look over the screen, and then return to Netscape's home page. It's great to look at a beautiful web page, but to hear something from a page adds a whole new dimension to your web experience. Many web pages offer sound, which can be played by your computer using two different methods. First, the sound can be streamlined directly from the web page through to your computer's speakers. You hear the sound as it's being transferred, not after it's been transferred. There are several types of streamlined audio used by web pages, such as real audio. The other way sound can be played from a web page is by actually downloading the sound file to your computer and opening up an audio player to play the sound. This takes a little longer to hear since you have to wait until the sound is downloaded. Look this over and then click to continue. In either case, your computer needs to have the right type of audio program to play sound. Programs that play audio are audio players. For example, the real audio player plays real audio sound files. So what happens if your computer doesn't have the right type of audio player to play a sound on the Internet? Well, Netscape can use what's called a plug-in. A plug-in is a software program provided by another manufacturer. Netscape can use different plug-ins to work with different types of files you might run into while surfing the Internet. Netscape comes with many plugins already, so you probably won't have to do anything special to listen to most audio files. Look this over and then click to continue. I've bookmarked a web page that lets you test your web browser's audio capabilities, among other things. Click the Bookmarks button. I'll highlight the My Stuff folder. Now click the last bookmark. This page lets you test various Internet features to see if your web browser can work with them. If you recall, a viewer is a program that lets you view or work with different types of information, such as a certain picture format. You can think of Navigator's different audio plugins as viewers, since they let you work with audio information. Press the Page Down key until you reach the Audio section. As I mentioned earlier, there are several different types of audio. The technical details aren't important right now, but basically a web page can offer sound in different formats. Let's test the wave sound. Wave sounds are always downloaded to your computer, then played. Go ahead and click the Test button. Here's the audio plugin that Navigator uses for wave files. It's in the process of downloading the file to your computer. We should hear something in a moment. <laughs> Once the sound was downloaded, Navigator used this little audio player to play the sound. The player is similar to a CD player and is quite simple to operate. You just click this button to play the sound, this button to pause, and this button to stop. You can also drag this little button to control the volume. Just for fun, click the play button to hear the sound again. That sound was pretty short. However, when you surf the net, you might find that some sound links take quite a while to download. Now close the player by clicking its close button.
Before we wrap up this lesson, I want to point out another web extra that's a component of Communicator. Netscape Netcaster enables you to subscribe to certain websites which are called channels. The web pages at those channels are then delivered automatically to your computer at certain time intervals. That way you don't have to manually access each web page for information. The Netcaster button on the personal toolbar provides a lot of information about using Netcaster. When you're running your real Navigator browser, you can check it out. Look over the screen and then close the Navigator window. Now click to move on to the review. It's time to review all the web features you've learned about. Click when you're ready to begin. This concludes Lesson 8 and the Professor Teaches Netscape Communicator course. Remember, you can take any part of this course again by referring to the course index located in the course menu. I've enjoyed exploring the Internet with you. Although we didn't cover everything Communicator can do, you now have the skills you need to start surfing the Internet on your own. Have fun experimenting with the web browser, mail program, and discussion groups. There's a lot of great stuff out there, and the help menu can give you a hand. Goodbye, and happy surfing. The Internet has a special tool specific. Now let's take a quick visit to a Gopher site.